Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we'll go ahead and um, we're going to get started. I know that um, the food line's still going. Please feel free to get your food and uh, sit down. Um, and uh, I am so honored uh, and so happy to invite you or to have you here today. My name is Lisa Youngblade, and I'm honored to serve as the Dean of the College of Health and Human Sciences. And I want to welcome you to our fourth annual College of Health and Human Sciences Research Day keynote address. I'd like to start off today's program with CSU's land acknowledgement, crafted by our indigenous faculty and staff, and presented in a video recognizing the long history of native peoples and nations that lived and stewarded the land where the university now resides. So if we could just all be in the moment and focus uh, for this next uh, moment, I would appreciate it, so thank you. Colorado State University acknowledges with respect that the land we are on today is the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute nations and peoples. This was also a site of trade, gathering, and healing for numerous other native nations. We recognize the indigenous peoples as original stewards of this land and all the relatives within it. As these words of acknowledgement are spoken and heard, the ties nations have to their traditional homelands are renewed and reaffirmed. CSU is a land-grant institution and we accept that our mission must encompass access to education and inclusion. And significantly, that our founding came at a dire cost to Native nations and peoples whose land this university was built upon. This acknowledgement is the education and inclusion we must practice in recognizing our institutional history, responsibility, and commitment. Thank you. Before we introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Buck Walter, I'd like to thank everyone, and I'm looking at you, that's all of you, for making Research Day such a meaningful celebration of the outstanding work in our academic units. Today, we're celebrating research and creative scholarship in this wonderfully complex college. Discoveries that include construction management, design and merchandising, education, food science and human nutrition, health and exercise science, human development and family studies, occupational therapy, education, and social work. We're improving physical, mental, and social well-being in all aspects of the human experience through advancements in science, research, and the application of knowledge. So on display today. What amazing posters we had this morning. In keeping with our land-grant heritage, our goal is to change lives for the better through the poster show, our keynote, and lightning talks by faculty and dean's fellows, we witness example after example of the transformative magic that happens in our college when brilliance, compassion, and innovation come together. Now I'm delighted to ask Dr. Mehmet Osbeck, professor and Joseph, Fel Joseph Phelps Endowed Chair in the Department of Construction Management to introduce our speaker, Mr. Gerald Buckwalter. Thank you, Dean Young Blade. Gerald Jerry Buckwalter serves as the Chief Innovation Officer for the American Society of Civil Engineers, or ASCE. Additionally, he oversees the Future World Vision Initiative, a forward leaning strategic assessment and visualization project where ASCE is creating a virtual and interactive computer model to assess potential built environments 50 years into the future. 
Mr. Buckwalter also served as president of his consulting firm, Strategy Essentials, specializing in business, market, and technology strategic planning. With over 35 years of experience, he came to AAC from Northrop Grumman, where he was director of corporate strategy. Mr. Buckwalter earned a bachelor's degree from Monmouth University and completed advanced coursework at George Washington University and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He has served on the National Infrastructure Advisory Council under Presidents Barack Obama and George W. Bush. He is a member of the board of the Center for Public Policy Innovation and has also served on the board of the National Homeland Defense Foundation. He was the 2018 recipient of the ASTE William H. Wisely American Civil Engineer Award and was an engineering news record top 25 newsmaker in 2019. I had the pleasure of meeting Jerry at a time when I was feeling quite pessimistic about the future myself. That was the year of my sabbatical. Now, for those of you who naturally question how one can feel pessimistic during their sabbatical, let me clarify by saying that my sabbatical squarely coincided with the COVID year. Through his work at the Future World Vision, he made me realize the importance of looking well beyond the near future. Further, his oral approach to envisioning and planning for the future gave many professionals, including myself, all the reasons to get excited and optimistic about the distant future again, notwithstanding the challenges the whole world was facing at the time. Management expert Peter Drucker has, has been widely credited with saying, you cannot predict the future, but you can create it. Jerry, through his numerous ideas and initiatives for envisioning the future, helps professionals all around the world do the much needed ultra long-term planning now to be able to create great futures for their communities. With that, please help me welcome Mr. Jerry Buckwalter to present his keynote speech on Envision the Future. Thank you, Mehmet. Good afternoon. It's great to be here. I, uh, this is going to be less of a presentation than a conversation, so prepare for some participatory activity. Um, and I won't let that interfere with your eating. Um, let me get my clicker here. I'll return to the stage from time to time to get my coffee. Other than that, we're kind of wandering around. I am very pleased to be here. You kind of got a feel for my background, which is a little unusual. I've ended up with a career that has spanned multiple industries and multiple disciplines, and certainly not the typical, and we'll talk a little bit at that, uh, about that at the end. Um, but to be honest, I was very worried. After three years of avoiding COVID, it nailed me six weeks ago. And unlike a lot of people, I was down and out for quite a few days. Of course, all I could think about was you know, whether I could make it to Colorado. But in that haze, I also, uh, it's kind of funny, I, I remembered hearing my wife who was starting to get worried talking to the clinic or the doctor or somebody and she was going through the symptoms. No, he has his taste, he seems to be smelling okay. No, I don't think he has a fever, but last night he was hot in bed. <laughs> I felt a lot better right away. <laughs> Here I am. I'm going to use a set of words that I use to kind of help us think about the future. Again, and I am engaged in what is called strategic planning, long-term planning, technology planning, sometimes scenario creation of the future, but I find most people don't get very provocative about it. So I use the word provoke, think, and act because also even those who do strategy well or planning for the future often never put it into any concrete actions today to get prepared for it. So that's a paradigm I'm going to come back to often. I might have to change that because I just realized that, uh, you know, I, I love acronyms, so PTA has already been stolen by the parents, your parents when you were in high school, so I'm going to have to reverse that. Anyway, here we go. I also think this is very urgent. I've done long range planning for a long time and you don't have to do things as excruciatingly difficult as what I've done and I'm gonna show you some of it if you're in periods of stasis. You know, if the future is evolving in a somewhat linear way 
and you can analyze those trends with great analytic continuity, and you're fine. But we are entering a period of time that based upon 30 years of work I've done, I'm convinced has the cascading interconnected impact of multiple trends that are gonna reach maturity within a relatively short period of time, and by that I mean about 50 years. More so, and more change than we've seen in 100 years or even 1,000 years. And I think it's time, and it's urgent enough, we need to spend some time thinking about that and what we're gonna do about it. First thing I do is I talk about how you have to start thinking about the trends, because it all starts with analyzing global trends of all sorts. So, three or four things to keep in mind. Everybody always focuses on what's going to change. I love this quote. I borrow it from Jeff Bezos. It's from very early in his career, which I'm sure you can figure out because it looks like his high school picture up there. And I love what he said when he said, and I'll just read it. In our retail business, we know that customers want low prices, and I know that's going to be true 10 years from now. They want fast delivery. They want fast selection. It's impossible to imagine a future 10 years from now where a customer comes up and says, Jeff, I love Amazon. I just wish the prices were a little higher. Or I love Amazon. I just wish you'd deliver a little more slowly. Impossible. And then he goes on to talk about it. He's since built a, a company and an empire based upon those kinds of things. And I think it's important to remember what are the outcomes the needs of people that are not going to change because they actually rarely change. What changes are the way we generate those outcomes, the cost to do them, or the quality of them. That's what changes. So the needs are relatively enduring. Another person I quote, this is Reed Hastings, uh, CEO of Netflix. And again, this is a quote from an interview he did with uh, Walt Disney 20 years ago, where he was anticipating what we now commonly know as streaming. And he said 25, 30 years ago, look for the things that are obvious. I love that phrase. The best forecasting is when you think about things that 10 years from now you look back and everybody says, well, that was obvious. That's what you're looking for. He said, it's obvious. The most attractive way to watch your entertainment is to snap your fingers and it comes on. Well, what's the closest thing to that? You just tie into an emerging internet and it streams. Well, that's back when our connectivity was sucky DSL. It took you three hours to download a movie. But he knew at some point it was obvious that there was a technology roadmap that was going to get us there. And he just kept experimenting, waiting for the moment when it was fast enough, had enough data rates, had a big enough bandwidth. There would be no adoption trade-offs that weren't too difficult. It's just simply easier to do it. There was no downside. And that the ecosystem of business opportunities would be self-reinforcing. There were lots of ways to make this viable from an economic or a market standpoint. So he, I, I take a lot from that. When I do a lot of future trend analysis, I look for those things that have the potential to be what is 20 years obvious. I also look for the things that are reinforcing. I'm just gonna use this one example, digital technology. I mean, we live with it now, but this is a slide I made 20 years ago. You knew cloud computing, which didn't, I had to change the word because 20 years ago, we didn't even call it that. Didn't need a server sitting below your desk. You could upload somewhere. You would have mobile connectivity that we now have with 5G. You'd have machine-to-machine -machine talking to each other. 
we'd actually develop analytics that would finally figure out how to absorb the real information in this huge volume of data, and on and on. Those reinforcing trends will create that ecosystem. I use an example from a different industry. This is from four, five years ago, four years ago. This is Herman Ricon, the CEO of Avianca, the world's second oldest airline, mostly a South American airline. But he did a statement that I copied down the principles. Basically said, I'm gonna transform this company from an airplane company into a company that's a digital company that happens to fly airplanes. Because digital affects everything. It can map every point of activity. It will require us to have different kind of partnerships because again, we know how to build airplanes. Aeronautical structures and wing design and propulsion, we don't know, so we're gonna to have to have partners. It's not gonna be regional, it's gonna be global. We're gonna to have to figure that out. We're gonna to have to have flexibility and options because it costs money to do this. So you gotta create some options to make sure it's affordable. You have to focus on innovation and you have to bring in a whole new set of talent to do it. I wish I could see this kind of forward-leaning leadership with strategic thought at a CEO level among other companies or other industries. This is rare to find. And we ought to celebrate people that actually start to get things like this and say, I have to move this company in this direction. Now I'm gonna use an example. For those who are a part of the construction community here, you've seen some of this before. Uh, Mehmet referred to it. It's the Future World Vision project that we did at the American Society of Civil Engineers, and it has elements that reflect this approach. First of all, this, we've been doing this for five years. We started with a very rigorous deep dive into some of the world's best forecasted material. But to be honest, based upon, it's available to the public, but based upon my previous uh, circumstances, I had easy access to, it was called futures analysis that's performed by the US intelligence community and the UK communi uh, intelligence community. It's some of the best in the world, still is to this day. We didn't just look at technology or infrastructure. This is an architectural engineering and construction example. But we had to look at everything because everything affects everything. There's another principle of why we look at everything, and you'll see this in what I'm going to talk about, and that is I'm a firm believer you don't plan to do in the future just the things you know you can do. Just because we can do it doesn't mean we ought to do it. We ought to do it because it produces the outcomes that meets the needs of people. I'm a very human-centric view of strategic planning. It has to produce a quality of life, a societal benefit. If it doesn't do that, we're not creating the future we all desire. That has to be examined first before we decide to design or build anything. So that's why we started with this. We then went through an analysis process. We narrowed it to the most important trends that would affect built infrastructure, because that was the purpose of this particular one. Some ubiquitous trends were there. They also kick in at different parts of the timeline where they reach maturity and actually begin to affect each other. So we had to follow that. All of which is used to generate, in this particular case, future scenarios. As I said before, we're in a time of great change, so we decided we were gonna do a classic scenario analysis exercise. Secondly, to do that, you have to examine the drivers of those trends, the certainty or uncertainties of those trends, and you have to forecast the outcomes they're gonna produce. You're gonna discover that's a favorite word of mine, outcomes. You don't look at capabilities first and only, you look at the outcomes it produces to fulfill the needs of people. And so from that, we would create a variety of scenarios, and in bundling those scenarios together, we would look for the common elements by which we would derive the resulting needs and realities of the future built environment. From that, of course, you then 
figure out what the engineering, construction, and design, and architectural roles are, partnerships that might be created, and the skill sets and capabilities that have to be coming in the next generation. Here's those key takeaways. Now, there's hundreds of takeaways from an exercise like this. This is the ones, and again, I, for those of you who might ever do scenario analysis, you know, you do all this hard work, you create these scenarios, we're gonna show you one of them. Boy, it looks like a lot of fun. And in the end, when nobody's watching, I say, I don't actually care what the scenario is. It doesn't matter to me. I deliberately create radically different scenarios. I don't create, I don't run a Monte Carlo exercise and create the most probable one. I want radically different ones. Because when I see a phenomena that's common to all four or five scenarios, now I know it doesn't matter which of those are most likely to be the future. We're going to have to do this. We're gonna to have to burn some calories on this. We're gonna to have to spin up our neurons. I mean, it's time to get to work. And it's worth it. Because, going back to Jeff Bezos, that's what's not going to change. It's common to every future scenario. For the AEC community, again, some of these will look very familiar to you. You saw them replayed in some of the other previous material. But a, the, the big four at the top, we're gonna to have to be far more resilient in both climate change slash extreme environmental conditions and in massive demographic changes slash urbanization slash, you know, whatever. Both will have an impact on the built environment that are equal. We're gonna to have to anticipate better technologies that are gonna be at our fingertips when that future built environment comes online. And we'll show you some examples of that. We're gonna to have to embrace the full benefit of digital technology, which creates intelligent systems, autonomy, lots of things. And my absolute favorite, we learn and we develop specialties. I am not anti-specialties. The last 150 years, of education and specialties has produced phenomenal advances. Think of medicine, healthcare, computers, I mean, go on and on. However, an unintended consequence is we rarely get out of our little cylinder of excellence, our stovepipe. And the common things we do that seem good for us have unintended consequences to other disciplines, other people, that's how we make mistakes. That's how the AEC community, for, with all forgiveness for those in the community here, successfully created some wonderful built environments and they also created the slums of today. That's how we, we have to think about this differently. We do that with systems integration. We think about how everything connects to everything else and that's why these exercises uh, uh, consider so much of these other things. Now, I've done this kind of work for almost 30 years, but you heard the intro from Mehmet. I spent most of my career working for clients that were mostly the Department of Defense and the, the intelligence community, and I've created scenarios and I've analyzed this stuff, and it's all classified and it's never seen the light of day. And it was time to take an affordable version of this and help civil society figure these things out. Secondly, Took me a whole career to figure this out. Nobody's a nerd like me is gonna read the 300 page document that I studied and created uh, for what the future scenarios are. I gotta turn this into something that can be absorbed by a lot of people. So where did I turn? Either you go to Hollywood for movie making or you go to the gaming industry. I went to the gaming industry and we created five, we're in the process of creating five city worlds we call them that are our scenarios, deliberately designed to be provocative and to tease out all the stuff we studied. And we made it an immersive storytelling. There's characters, there are narratives, there's environments. We looked at all this. 
from a citywide view right down to a neighborhood to a street corner because that's how you see how you might live. And so that's what we did uh, in order to turn this into something that a lot of people can absorb and start to internalize and start to figure out, well, what's my role in this? These are the five city worlds we decided on. The mega city is done. You can go to futureworldvision.org and download that for free. ASCE has made that freely available to everyone. It's built on Unity, a classic gaming engine, and you can play with it on your computer. Go explore. See what a highly dense, massively vertical, 50 million populated city looks like. You'll see some interesting things. And mostly, we made it aspirational, which is very different than the way most commercial producers of visual content. I mean, let's face it, the world is going to be dominated by robots and they're gonna come and kill everybody, right? That's what Hollywood does with this. We made it aspirational. How do we make decisions now for what we want the world to look like with all this technology phenomena? Now, that's not to mean we didn't embed a little bit of dysfunction at some other spots because we want people to spot it because that's how you learn from mistakes that you make. So it's got a deliberate amount of both. Now, the cities out on the right are obviously more speculative than the ones on the left. And I show here just a sampling of the disruptions, the innovations, some of the informed speculation based upon the research that would come into play over time that would help create these cities of the future. But the first one is done. And this is it, so I'm gonna show you a clip that shows the kind of questions we ask ourselves. That's the whole reason for doing this. It's not to solve the problem. There's engineers and constructors and, and architects who are gonna solve the problem. They have all the tools. They're here being trained to do that. This is about asking ourselves a different question than we might have asked ourselves before. And so I'll show you an example of that. If you don't make a plan or make a goal and have a vision, then you just react your way into the future. And that's not what we want to do as civil engineers. We want to lead into the future. How we do our jobs as civil engineers, maybe as systems engineers, will be different in the future. What are the different cities we see evolving? And how can we really get an understanding of those cities? How can we immerse ourselves in those cities today? What are the different social infrastructures, physical infrastructures that can be created in which we can all come together and thrive? What's really important about looking at this through a world building lens is that it is designed to look forward and then thread back into the present. The further out you look, the more it changes our view of the present. We're literally forced to not only reimagine our communities, uh, but to rediscover our neighbors to rediscover many of the things that uh, are right in front of us. We're spatializing narrative and allowing the user to tell their own story as they navigate the experience of this virtual cityscape. What can a mega city grow toward so that it's serving a better purpose? You start looking at individual buildings then because you can typically shape a building. And can you connect several buildings together? The buildings might form coalitions and, and interact with the utility, and the utility will interact uh, with the uh, providers of energy all around. That becomes a transactive energy system, and the buildings can play an active role. I can design a microgrid that serves that district, or if we need the microgrid to serve an adjacent district, we layer those together. We need a water supply system that can meet 15 million people's needs. Every building in the future should be capturing sunlight and rainwater, and every building should be recycling its own waste. Ideally, the life cycle of infrastructure is one that is continuous or perhaps reused in the future without going back and re-emitting all that carbon to do the same thing over again. That's the way we've built over the last century and we simply cannot do it anymore. Buildings are not unlike a human body. They have bones and skin. They consume energy and regulate temperature and generate waste. 
What if architects use genetic tools from synthetic biology to encode the architecture of buildings right into the DNA of organisms? The facades now become active components. And one active thing that facades can do, they can breathe or they can sweat. You can infuse biological functionalities into structural building materials. Almost 100% of all the controls in buildings are gonna have some element of AI in them and machine learning. As you walk into the building in the morning, the building will recognize you by your electronic signature. You would have created a profile about your temperature, your ventilation preference, and then some of this microenvironment might follow you. What would social cohesion look like in the city of 2070? I mean, it's reasonable to expect that it would actually be vertical. So, you know, going vertically also brings its own challenges in terms of safety and security. You might have 175 drones coming in at 11.45 a.m. delivering lunch. Where do they land? How much space are between them? What are the specifications? It just has to be designed in a way that people can interact and making sure that you're encouraging paths of travel that are spontaneous. We're at just the right point in time to get together and build basically the aerial equivalent of what we did in this country with the national interstate highway system and no longer be restricted to two dimensions. So how do you get the public involved in civil engineering, in the process of civil engineering? One of the best ways that we can make sure that all voices are heard and included is to start with the people who are doing the planning and developing and see what their teams look like. How can you ensure social equity and social justice and get input from the community for the projects that we're working on? We are very conscious about the demographic, the diversity of the community and the society, and make sure that we don't leave anybody behind. Creating these multi-use spaces is one way of doing that, of bringing people together. And once they're in the same shared space, there is more opportunity for connection, there's more opportunity for shared experience, there's more opportunity for civil dialogue. The best solutions on Earth, they come with diversity of thought. What I love most about the Future World Vision Project is that we can think about it together. We can have this dialogue. Users will encounter one another and have conversations across disciplines that will begin to feed back and bring new information into the system. We're trying to build a world and trying to build a machine that is creating absolute engagement of the user and of the engineer in their own future. The Future World Vision is really at the core of what we're trying to do at ASCE in transforming the idea of what a civil engineer can be. And that's how we think that we can advance the profession of civil engineering and attract the best and brightest. Oh my goodness. This fourth industrial revolution married to the fundamentals of concrete, glass, and steel is this incredible toolbox for society. It's really on us as civil engineers to pull that all together. Okay, it's just an example. Again, I'm under contract to ASCE. That's an example of the kind of thing you want to do if you're going to be both thoughtful and provocative. Provoke and think. Deep research, good, analyst, good analysis of that, but engage some imagination and creativity, be innovative. That's important. Now, ultimately, provoke, think, act, it has to lead to action. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on that. Um, anybody know what that's an image of? There's a phrase. What's the first character doing? Crawling. Second, walk. Third, run. I'm a firm believer. Crawl, walk, run. You're going to create a strategy as you look at the future, because now you have to take action. A strategy based upon this future world vision is no good unless you have now a tactical plan and you figure out how you're going to resource that. This is difficult for everyone. You have to balance that against the investments you have to make for what your profession is doing today. Now, I realize this is hard. 
up and say, this is like changing the tire on the bus while the bus is rolling. Sorry, it's just what we have to do. So you have to find affordable ways to validate the strategy. So you take that tactical action plan, you resource it in small bite-sized pieces, get some feedback. Is anybody familiar with the term sprints in computer software development? Sprints are one, okay, we got one in the back. Uh, sprints are one week or two week long, quick turns, you develop it, you revisit, did it accomplish what you want, you make adjustments, the team digs down in, does some more development, you're constantly turning over and over again. I apply that same con concept to the action part of the strategy of looking at the future. Don't, don't wait till it's a perfect strategy, you'll never get it. It'll become a coffee table book that nobody reads. Take some action in affordable ways, test it out, make adjustments, mm -hmm. and move on and do it again. If you don't, all futures analysis leads to paralysis. It just seems too overwhelming. So, I'm gonna use an example of that quick turn thinking process, and I just picked one uh, for today's uh, topic. There's a big movement around the world, uh, generally kind of uh, called net zero carbon emissions as we deal with climate change. It's a great goal. I'm very worried nobody's creating actual resourced tactical plans that make sense and that we're measuring to see if we're making the progress we want. And some reasons why I've become very worried about that. Now there's some good news. Most companies have generated that as a goal. Okay, okay, so we put that on paper. That's good, good start. Europe is serious about it. They are on a path to generate 85% of the electricity from renewable sources by 2030, more than any other country in the world. However, there's some bad news here. Net zero philosophy, which I think is really important, this is an existential crisis, requires battery storage for renewable power sources that would require, according to the recent published Bank of America net zero chart book, for pretty well studied, six times the currently mined minerals on planet Earth. 384 new mines just for the batteries alone. If you're really paying attention and take a look at the few countries that actually have control of most of the output of those, you'll realize that the surge for batteries to do the net zero carbon movement, electric cars in particular, is producing almost slave-like conditions in the Congo as people are being stolen from their families to mine the cobalt needed for what we're, path, the path that we're on as, as a globe. Somebody should have thought about that before we started putting this into action. So, secondly, somebody had better come up with a plan as to how we're going to finance this. To a truly achieve net zero would require, according to Bank of America, $5 trillion per year for the next 30 years, more than the entire tax revenue of the United States every year for the next 30 years. We need to have a plan, otherwise it's just wishful thinking. We've gotta have a strategy that plans for those things. That's kind of what we tried to do with Future World Vision. Let's think about all those cascading, impacting elements. Otherwise, it's not really a strategy. We don't have the ways and means to get there. Are we also considering unintended consequences? And I, I have several examples of this, but I just picked one for today. Solar and wind are a big part of renewable energy. So, solar, if you take a look over five years from those five, uh, four sources, has had a wonderful rollout of new solar panels. That's the good news. I also hear all the rhetoric about how, all the jobs that it's gonna create. The entire industry globally had an 11% net reduction in jobs, just like the net reduction in coal, uh, coal and, and oil and natural gas. No different, same. We're on that path no matter what. That's a red herring. 
based upon everything I've seen so far. But it's still good to move the solar, but just understand it does, it's not all that we pretend it to be. Secondly, producing something with renewables has some unintended consequences for some regions. This one hasn't been highlighted very much yet, much yet but in just this last year, we produced in our government, a $140 billion package to do some great things that's needed. One of, piece of that is for renewable energy, including ethanol and methane production to replace oil and natural gas. What nobody's planning for is those are horrible industries if you want to talk about water pollution. And the heartland of the U.S. is about to enter a massive degradation in water quality as a result of that. That's certainly not what we intended but we haven't thought through all the cascading impact. Also, some of you may not be big advocates for this, I am, but we should all figure out our part to play. So a couple examples, and I only throw this up because again, I want us to personally think about the role you have in these things as well. So one way to do this is do things virtually. Email is a minute part of the emissions compared to mailing a letter. Makes sense, right? But I'll bet we don't think about even the energy cost to do that. For instance, if you send four texts a day with just one photo in that text, you create the same emissions in a year as a car traveling, uh, you create the same emissions as a car that's traveled 415 miles. There's a whole set of energy things that go into your little tidbit of energy to produce that computer and to send it in the wires and on and on and on. I love this last one because I deal with a lot with consulting to people in industry. Industry doesn't run on text. Industry runs on emails. I'm going to tell you, people sit at desks all day long, inundated. My normal email load per day is about 300 emails, most of which I just delete, delete, delete. Because everybody wants to keep everybody informed. That's a good thing. A common phenomena, you want to acknowledge you got the email, right? Every, I call it the thank you email. You click, you respond. If everybody in the world that has a computer and uses email sends one less thank you email, doesn't do anything, just acknowledges that you got it. Per day, it's the equivalent of taking 3,334 cars off the road. We rarely think about our personal part of this action. Or don't drive. Again, a valid thing. I can fly from New York to Los Angeles, and my one person component of that emissions is half of what if I chose to get in a car and drive that. But I could do it on a train for 15% of the emissions, but as a country, we're not investing in rail infrastructure the way we're investing in other things, and I don't know why. Because that's, that's a better solution. Make everyday choices. There's stuff we do today because we live in such an energy draining world. It's so common, we just don't think about it. Now, if you go back to pre-industrialization, look at the Bitcoin transaction formula. Now, we're not in that age, so let's throw that away, but Here's a, here's a good one, because I always like things to compare things to other things to see what the value stream actually looks like. If you chose to stream one less movie per day, an average movie about an hour and a half long, that would be the equivalent in yearly electrical output of 21 homes with a refrigerator. One movie per day versus 21 people that can have refrigeration of their food. Those are the kinds of things I encourage everyone to think about it when you take your personal part in assessing whether your role in this strategy is good or not. And then secondly, we have to have to look and see whether those things that we did are working. And clearly, they are not yet. You, this is now common knowledge. You can read it in any newspaper article where coal, gas, everything's still climbing despite our best intentions. So that's the way, the way we have to do these small bite-sized things and then change the plan if it's not working. Doesn't mean the goal wasn't, was bad, it means you have to actually make it real. 
Now, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite topics, because part of getting all this done is for all of us, uh, all of us to become more innovative. It's one of my favorite topics, so I'm going to stall on this one. Think about it. What's the world's greatest innovations? Or you could replace that with what's the world's greatest inventions? Three, three, I want three volunteers. The wheel. There's the first one. That, that was always my first one, too. Say that again, glasses? Eyeglasses. Good one. I don't even have that on my list. And back here. Medicine. We don't understand. We think innovation is something that's unusual. This is, this is built into our DNA. Our species is innovative. Take a look at the history. And I picked my own versions of this. I always thought the wheel was like the first one. I did some research, and you know, if you take a look at China and, and India and some other places, you go back, they were pouring concrete 8,000 years ago of some similar nature. A loom emerged. We have the wheel, we have sails, we kind of hit a flat period, uh, and, and, and now you're into what we think of as the ancient world, okay? And then it begins to ramp up. We figure out how to do agriculture, we invent the plow, we kind of keep going. Of course, we reach gunpowder because we have to find more efficient ways to kill each other, uh, you know, um, and the compass. And then, notice the curve, we go through the dark ages. Everybody's just trying to survive, not much innovation going on. Then we hit what I'll call the emergence of the modern era, starting with the printing press. And boy, it just launches from there, and we're still on that pathway. We are incredibly innovative as a species. Now, I like to go back to my principle. I always like to assess those for their value based upon quality of life, societal benefit, what the human needs, not just because we could do it. So you have to figure out what's your favorite one of those. And I'll just share just for laughs, my favorite on that list is the toilet. We save two million lives per year, every year, still to this time, by putting sanitization into areas of the world and creating that phenomenon. Which would I rather have, a toilet or the internet? I'll take the toilet, sorry. Think, think, well you wanna be adding value to people around you and to the society you live in. Everything you do should be always measured in those terms. Now, how do we generate innovation? There's a lot of myths out there. There's this brilliant light bulb moment mythology and all the things that go with it. I'm sorry, it just doesn't happen that way. It doesn't happen that way in your brain. Your neurons follow pathways based upon the thoughts you've already had. And when you force yourself to connect two dissimilar thought patterns, the neurons actually have to find a new pathway. That's the way it happens in your head. I think that's a good analogy for what happens in the external world. This is a picture of the Grand Cafe in Oxford, England. Supposedly the first coffee shop in the world emerged in 16 something, I can't remember now, it came online. Now, why is this significant? Up to this point in time, if you were in England, you drank alcohol because the water wasn't safe to drink. And you drank it kind of morning, noon and night because it was your only safe option. So effectively, you were drunk all day. Some of you might be able to relate to that better than others, I don't know. Now, what happened at the same time is what we call the Enlightenment. I mean, things in the world started to spark. I think there's some piece of this that's related to that. Now, one could say, well, instead of drinking alcohol, they were just more alert because they had drank coffee and tea. But I think it's the setting. The coffee house became the setting where people gathered 
from every discipline, every industry, every level of government, every gender, that had never happened before. And the production of that conversation across paths of ideas that were dissimilar and separated prior to that, I think is a critical part of being innovative. Steve Jobs has a quote that kind of explains that. He, it's mostly, the, you know, you've heard the phrase connect the dot thinking. I like to think of it as mosaic thinking, because I think it's more than one dot. You're seeing a mosaic of things all the time. And he said, you, you, you ask creative people how they did something, feel a little guilty, because they just saw it, because they were exposed to enough dissimilar things, those things started to emerge, and they started to synthesize them. Now, I want to talk about strategy, because again, people talk about long-term strategy for the future, but it's really about creating value. I'm going to breeze through this pretty quickly, because I think we're running out of time. A strategy doesn't guarantee your success. You're just increasing your odds. But more importantly, at the bottom, strategy for the future is about making some choices. Nobody has infinite bandwidth. Nobody has infinite resources. So, you have to stop doing something in order to do something for the future that you need to start planning for it. Now, it might be a small percentage, that's okay, but we rarely carve out enough time, resources, or money to do that. If we don't do that, I don't care what your strategy is, you're just never going to achieve it. Secondly, most of us do what I call inside-out thinking. We think about the capabilities of our profession, and we see the trends and we project with great analytic continuity where that will go and what needs we will meet. I suggest in times of massive change, outside in thinking is the better equation. You need a little bit of both, but this is the classic market demand. What will people need? And in this case, think of future world vision, what will they need 50 years from now? Now I draw back in and say, now what do I have to do today to get to that point, and maybe I don't have the capabilities, so I learn them, or I go buy them, or I do whatever I need, but don't constrain yourself to just what you can do or your industry can do. I'm gonna skip past this because, in the spirit of time, uh, three, three, and I sum it up with this. People who really are good at long-term thinking about the future generally have these things at the forefront of their mind. Outcome-based innovation mindset, systems thinking, all the ecosystem, how it works together, and a perspective that's generated by where you're going, what the end state is. Since we're here today, now I'm gonna talk mostly to students, not to the professors that are in the room, but you're on a journey. You're all going to be part of this. I think you are at the point where it's time to start making some decisions. So I wrote down a couple things that I think are important. I find not just of your student you know, ages, but people of all ages sometimes rarely have put together what their whole belief system is and who they really are and end up being very imitative of other people. Just that's, you can do better than that. And your behavior should be in the context of that identity. Also, I think it's really important that you don't do things just for yourself. You might have some long-term goals, but uh, you, you want to be generating value to other people. That's the highest satisfaction. And surround yourself with people that, that share and, and will support you, give you a safe space to do that. I think there's three general areas where this plays out in your education, ultimately in the work you do and the relationship you have. Now, I'm only going to talk about two of them because I'm not an expert in relationships. My, my, my family is so type A. We jab each other in order to improve each other. It's not the soft, cuddly family experience. I mean, we laugh at how competitive we are, but I laugh harder. Um, but, so I'm not gonna talk on that one, but I'm gonna talk about education. So just a quick set of thoughts. Because I work a lot for industries and I see very common phenomena in disconnects between those who are graduating and the, the way people in industry, no matter what your profession are thinking. One, don't avoid, 
stress. College is supposed to be hard. This is, this is, this is the way life is. Work through the ability to deal with it. Foster some autonomy. We live in an age that we're enabled by mobile devices where we can contact everybody under the sun to get aid and advice when we need it. Start to be a little more self-sufficient. That's not bad, but develop a local power of community to handle how you're gonna get through tough things because life will be filled with tough things. And as a result of that, don't just participate. Fail fast. That's my philosophy. Fail fast in tiny ways. Make the adjustment. Get better. It's how you learn to create value. It's how you earn your right to, to be heard. And avoid any self-absorption with such a common phenomena, which is actually believing the curated view, view of ourselves and others that has become a commonplace thing that we all do. Just be aware that that's happening. Understand the economic construct of the careers you're going to be on. This, the old days of working for someone for your whole life are pretty much gone. So be prepared to be a free agent, moving along, learning as you go, and lifelong learning becomes a really important part of that. And ultimately, you want a voice to be heard, but be willing to accept that you earn that right and respect by the value pr you produce, and then believe me, you get all the voice you want. Important, important to understand. Okay, now everybody has a unique path. Mine is a little unusual, so I'm just gonna share a little piece of it. But my point is, don't worry so much about the pathway. Have some long range goals, but it's hard to predict the pathway. Everyone's unique. Every response you take to even bad situations create a learning event for the next one. Mine is a little odd. I grew up in a small farm in Pennsylvania. Fairly insular Pennsylvania Dutch community. I went to school in New York City. Boy, was that an eye opener. Totally different. Now, some people are afraid of that. I loved it. It's like, now I understand the world around me a lot better. But then what emerged was this strange pathway no one could have anticipated. I put the Cairo on here. I was 27 years old electronics engineer working for the Army as a civil servant, working on radar systems, actually countermeasures, trying to keep uh, Army pilots alive in case somebody shot at them. That, that was my role in my first real full-time job. I got a call one day. My, I, I was married. My first son was only six months old. I was traveling everywhere. So I got a call and said, you need to go to San Diego. Okay, dress, you don't need anything, no presentations, just dress for warm weather. Um, I said, fine. Uh, they said, oh, um, by the way, we'll take care of all your flight arrangements. Now for a civil servant, you didn't, that's very unusual. They said, no, no, we'll, a, a helicopter, an army helicopter will pick you up at, this was in Fort Monmouth, New Jersey at the time and take you down to Andrews Air Force Base and then you'll be on an Air Force plane with some other engineers. But this is really odd. Now, I wasn't as bright as you are. So I did that. I got on the plane on a jump seat with six other engineers that I didn't know from the Army, Air Force, and Navy. But I knew in about half an hour, we were not flying west. We were flying east, over the water. And when we landed, many hours later, it was on a private airstrip outside of Cairo. And we were met by two gentlemen that to this day, I don't know their names, but I assume they were with the CIA. And they said, we have a Soviet tank out in the desert. You six people have five hours to climb around that tank, take it apart, try to figure out the electronics of the missile system so that you can go back, reverse engineer it, and we can design protective measures in case that system shoots at us. 
We did that as best we could, put back, got another couple hours of sleep. I was back on the jump seat, flew back in, came home, walked through the front door. Honey, I'm home from San Diego. <laughs> I didn't get the call till 30 years later that that's now declassified. You can tell anybody you want. So I do, because <laughs> that system isn't used anymore. It, how could I have predicted as an electronics engineer that that would happen to me? And it changed the course of my pathway. I truly embrace that there's some valuable things to do as part of the military industrial complex that are of good value to society. Wouldn't say that about everything, but to me. And so I began this pathway. I ended up working on, believe it or not, for two years on national security measures for the government in Rome, in Italy. Um, wild experience that introduced me to the way people around the world, engineers, technologists, thought about these things. Ultimately, as Mehmet said and introduced you to, I ended up in some roles, advisory roles, working with the Washington complex, the obviously most dysfunctional piece of all those pathways. I only share it because at your age, I want you not to worry so much about what your pathway is. You embrace each one, you do the good job, you work hard at it, you show the value that you can produce, and then the opportunities will open up for your next step, and you'll do them. One last thing, now I'll come back to my story, from my storytelling to the provoke, think, and act. As you think about the future, I also encourage you to challenge yourself. When I do future World Vision presentations, I can always look at the audience and there's a third of the audience that are like, okay, I get it. Mama, you were in that category, okay. And there's a third that just don't get it. And then there's a third that I know are just skeptics. That ain't gonna happen. I don't believe that much change is going to come. I want you to encourage to think about this. Here's a historical example. There was a meeting of engineers in London a little over 100 years ago. Nobody said they were stupid. They had a real problem. They looked at transportation. They looked at the nature of transportation as it existed then. They could predict how much biological waste a horse would produce, what the population densities were on a pathway to be, they knew that they were in trouble. And they made all sorts of projections. Now we look and say, well, that didn't happen. Once the automobile appeared, those projections weren't just wrong, they were ridiculous. <laughs> What's really funny is, when that happened, the automobile was hailed as an environmental savior. <laughs> Any disruption, but I'm reminded that I'm hearing those kind of conversations today. We're burning through money on highway, uh, you know, infrastructure that if we really looked at autonomy, just in 50 years, that's not what we would be building. Now we need some stuff now, but how are we gonna balance that? So if you're among those who are the scoffers, I'll give you a real live instead of a historic one. I think about autonomy. We're all focused on the cars, but I think there's autonomy in the air that could leapfrog that. Not everybody's of that same opinion. Have anybody heard about the global hawk? Does that resonate with anybody? That's an existing program. This is a plane larger than a 747. It's huge. It's co-owned by the Department of Defense and NASA it takes off from military airspace, climbs to 80,000 feet, which is above the national airspace of any country in the world, and then it flies around the world. Now, just in case you're getting alarmed, there are no weapons on this. But it is a surveillance, an intelligence, and a reconnaissance. God, it's just filled with equipment as the United States watches the world. The other good news, just in case you're worried, is that equipment, I can vouch, because I'm intimate with this, intimately familiar with this program, never turns on over the continental United States. We do not surveil what's going on on our own people. But the minute we're outside the boundaries, it turns on. 
there's no pilot on the plane. There's no one remotely piloting it from the ground. You tell it where to go, it decides how high to fly, where to go, how to get there, and how to get back. Seems pretty incredible, right? That's high tech. Any guesses as to when that program went into effect after about five years of development? No, it was after that, because we didn't have the autonomy back then. But it's been flying since 2001. There's no technological hurdles to autonomous flight for people. It's just a regulatory issue when we decide to transfer the tech the tech transfer to the civilian space, perfectly easy to do, and how we're going to manage that. That's the kind of things that are going on that, again, we just have to anticipate. Because it's not an issue of technology, it's about being stewards of technology for the ultimately, I'll repeat it again, quality of life and societal benefit we all want to have. Lastly, I encourage people not to be too resistant. An example from when electric motors came online. The factories in the United States and everywhere were run with steam-powered motors. When that came online, it took 30 years for the factories to reconfigure to actually optimize the value, the affordability, the productivity of an electric motor. Why did it take so long? Well, there were studies done on this. There's multiple reasons. But the biggest reason, they had to wait for the factory managers to retire or die. Should be a lesson in that for us, because you're learning stuff now that in 20 years might get upended. Be ready to be flexible and keep learning, because those things are going to come. And therefore, you get to be an agent of change in this process, which hopefully you all want to do. And that's kind of it for today. I've overrun my stay, but that's the way I look at envisioning. I don't say future planning. I like to envision it. That's why I gave the future world vision as an example, so that we can really internalize what does this mean for us and what's the outcome that's going to come. Thank you. Thank you. Seems to be working. Is it? You sound good to me. Sounds great. Well, okay. If you can hear me, Matt. So, thank you, Mr. Buckwalter, for your inspiring presentation. We have a few minutes remaining for the Q&A, and I and uh, Dr. Matt TQ over there will be passing, have the microphones, and we'll be passing those to the ones who want to ask questions. So, uh, please. Dr. Michelle Foster, first out of the gates. Looking at the complexity of the future visions, how do you get everybody on board with this idea of sustainability? Because if you don't get buy-in with everybody, is it gonna happen? I could ask the same question about a multitude of things in addition to sustainability, and yes, I don't have, there's no silver bullet. I don't have a magic answer for this. But I think we have to take the research that we do and turn it into something more motivating. That's why we did this gaming engine so that people could begin. Because otherwise, everybody's a skeptic and, and, and you just can't get it. And any non-functioning cog in the wheel of progress, the, you know, the progress stops. So we certainly have that with climate change. We have that with sustainability right now. We have all of that. So I don't think there's any magic answer, but I will say this. I'm a big fan that all change happens at a seedling level, at a grassroots basis, and grows over time. And yes, some of those, the drought will cause it to wither, but I am an eternal optimist that you don't stop trying, you just keep doing it with the proper rigorous research and imagination that you need to make it real and you try to get by in. Now, one thing I will add, so much of what we do in society, not just in this country but all country, 
is up to government decision makers. And boy, that's where we run into a real problem because many of them don't understand some of this phenomena or they're driven by political motivations it's just not convenient or whatever. So my advice to everybody, for instance, in the architectural engineering and construction community where they have this in spades, relative to sustainability is find the one or two champions in government, generally early career, early to mid career, who are willing to bet their career on doing the right thing and you give them all the support you can and if they get one smidgen of success, the good news is humans live by comparison. And when some government leaders see somebody else get success, they try to figure out how to imitate it. And it starts to take off. But you gotta get the first seedlings going. So all I can say is don't tire of finding the champions, the seedlings, and allowing them to grow and nurturing them. Thank you. I was hoping Dr. Bell would raise his hand. Thanks for the talk. Um, it, it sounds like necessity is the mother of invention. Um, Often. And, and then also things like, like COVID um, brought about improving remote working and, and telecommunication, the situation in Ukraine promoting European reliance on non-gas for fuel. Is there a way to manufacture the next crisis so that we can push <laughs> forward the progress? Oh my goodness. That's all the ingredients of a conspiracy theory here. Um, I, I would modify your comment a little bit. Yes, necessity is a driving element. I would add to that. There's another driving element we mostly ignore and that's the economics of the solutions. So necessity drove us with COVID, but we equally made some horrible choices as well as good choices. So some things that were going to happen anyway launched quickly, like working virtually, virtual communications, that's all good. And we're never gonna go back to the way it was in its entirety. Well, there'll be some in between place that we get back to. That's fine. So I think there are ways to convey the necessity via mostly visual and auditory media delivery that create an appearance of necessity. But one of the ways that I choose to do that, in the absence of you know, going in some back room and doing a drug deal, to, 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 to create a false something, we've got plenty of people in the world trying to do that, is creating these visualizations. It's, there's a reason we have a movie industry. It captures the heart and mind of people. There's stuff you remember and you start to internalize. I'm a firm believer we turn what we know to be of necessity maybe five years from now or 10 years from now. We find a way to visualize that so people begin to internalize that now and drive that force. The second thing we do is we keep thinking innovation for innovation's sake. You do innovation because of the outcomes it produced for the needs of people, and then you find the business model by which it becomes financially reasonable and self-sustaining, almost without government support, to actually be sensible for people to put money into and make it happen. I'm a business guy. I mean, I, I was trained as a physicist. They knew right away, never put a lab coat on that guy and let him do real physics work. You know, I pretend to be an engineer and then, you know, I become a businessman because I realize I've watched innovative people create economic models that drive incredible change in the behavior of people. And your iPhone is a classic example of that. We went from a device that we thought was going to be a phone to something to, to put your apps on, which nobody even knew what an app was back before that was. So, but there was an economic model that drove it, and it didn't need any government support. There's no taxpayer money that went into that. I think there's ways we can look for that economic paradigm to drive these things, because 
even in the most socialistic economic societies, they're now starting to drive more by those economic models than we realize. Um, so I actually spent some time with the Chinese Sovereign Wealth Fund, who are investing all over the world in what you'd think was the most highly capitalistic mindset that you've ever seen. Economics can drive this. So I think we look for inference and visualizations of what will be economic necessity and an economic model that will drive it. Heather, I'm so sorry. I, I, I have to keep us on schedule, so I'm going to ask you to join me in saying thank you to Jerry. Yeah. Thank you. It's my pleasure.